What's happening, Wargamers? Welcome to another episode of The Dossier, the Marvel Crisis Protocol review show where we discuss all things Marvel Crisis Protocol character-related, from their uh, their model design to how we think they look, how hard they were to paint, assemble, and then, of course, what they can do on the table itself. Today, uh, we are bringing Heimdall. Uh, now, remember, these are not meant to be comprehensive discussions. They're just meant to kind of get the ball rolling. There's lots of really great discussion and expert talk out there if you want to get further into these characters. These are just kind of meant to spark that initial interest in it. And, of course, these shows can't help them without the wonderful support of all the patrons out there. Uh, if you want to support the channel, patreon.com slash Studios. Thank you so much for everyone who is currently a patron. And, of course, if you're just here to, uh, to check out the video, you know, if you can hit that like and subscribe button, that does help with um, with knowing what sort of content to keep making as well. So thank you so much for that as well. So, yeah, today we are talking about Heimdall, the all-seeing. Uh, and uh, this was a fun one because first time Heimdall got on the channel, it, it involved what I like to call Rainbow Gate. Uh, you know, some, some people took offense to the uh, to the rainbow on uh, on Heimdall himself. So let's, let's talk about him here. So this model, I, I think it's... Well, the pose itself is is kind of dull. It is very evocative of Heimdall. He's got the sword going into the Bifrost. He's he's ready to kind of control it. I love the addition of the of the Bifrost rising up around him. Uh, it just makes for a really really nice extra effect. It's very good use of the uh, the space on the model. So even though it kind of looks a little crowded, I think at the same time it works really nicely to him. I also love the fact that Heimdall himself is just friggin' jacked in this. He is just so big and imposing. Um, so as far as like sort of like a simple model goes, I actually really really like him. Uh, as you can see, I also went with the uh, the black Heimdall, the Idris Elba uh, Heimdall, which I you know I, I just really like. Uh, I really enjoyed that one, and like the color schemes, the browns, the reds, the golds, all work really nicely together. Makes for uh, makes for a wonderful model. He was actually a lot of fun to paint. Uh, now I highly recommend you assemble the model and you do the bifrost separately. That's what I did. Uh, I was able to get in here and do the uh, the airbrushing on the, the bifrost to kind of give it that that gradient look, which I'm very pleased with. Um, and then hit it with a, a gloss, so it's uh, it's nice and shiny. Uh, trying to showcase all that. But uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, it's it's odd because a lot of time you know with a with a model that doesn't have a lot of dy uh, dynamic aspects to it or or it's very fluid. I typically am like eh, it's okay. Heimdall, however, just really spoke to me. I I love the model. I thought it was a lot of fun to uh, put together. So what does Heimdall bring to the table? Let's take a look here as I move some stuff around here. So Heimdall brings, uh, he's got uh, threes across the board for his defenses. He's got six stamina. He is a three threat, size two, with a medium movement. On his other side, you see he goes down to five. So he's got 11 stamina total there. So he, he's right in line with a lot of other three threats. He's, you know, not the most durable, but he's, he can take a punch as well. That six stamina, uh, again, the difference between five and six can really be the difference between an extra action being needed to, to deal with him. Uh, so yeah, very, very basic in that regard. As far as attacks, he's got a physical strike, range two, five dice. It is a uh, builder attack. There are no other notes here aside from the fact that, uh, everything he wants to do is at about range two, which does make it a little bit tricky to, to kind of keep him where you want him to be. Uh, then he's got Horfund, which is another physical attack, range two, seven dice for three power. If it deals damage, it can push a target character away medium. There is no size restriction on this, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it just needs to deal damage, which on seven dice, you have a fairly good chance of dealing some damage on there. Uh, my only complaint with it, it it's the range two. It's, it's the, the range two is really difficult. It means you're, you're spending uh, actions doing other things instead of uh, double tapping or anything like that. Uh, we have an active ability, Guardian of the Bifrost, for three. Choose this character or another allied character within four and place it within two of its current position. Character can only be placed by the superpower once per turn. So it gets a little pricey if you want to do it multiple times, but this is a way to mitigate that range two. It allows him to get placed. Uh, get a little bit closer, maybe take that key objective, uh, or get within uh, get within range of um, of someone who is you know threatening somebody the rest of your team, or even just get them in range of support. So really solid. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's power it's three power, but it's also something that if it was anything less, it'd probably be on the broken side of things. We have a reactive power called the All C and I for two. When an allied character within three is attacking, defending, or dodging during the modified dice step, you can use this power, and you can reroll two of its own, uh, and the allied character may reroll up to two of its own dice. 
So, I mean, he is allied to himself, so he can use his ability himself. Uh, alternatively, when an allied character within three rolls a dice for a crisis card or tactics teams, uh, team tactics cards, uh, you also get to reroll two of its own dice. So, for two power, this gives you a really nice utility reroll. It's, you know, one power for one die being rerolled, which is you know, always really solid. The three is a tad bit restrictive. But in the grand scheme of things, it's never it's not going to be the make or break on this particular ability. A lot of time you're able to kind of get within that three. Six inches is, is a lot more range than uh, than you kind of give it credit for sometimes. Uh, and it's really good. The big downside is he's very power hungry and trying to get in within that strike range to build that power. You're spending a lot of power to get there. It's almost kind of a break even point at some point. Uh, I find a lot of time you have to kind of choose which abilities you're using. Next up, we got a reactive ability for Fend for two power. When an enemy character ends a movement within two of this character, this character may use this move power, immediately make a strike against them. It can only be used once per turn. So, I mean, it's, it's a way of trying to punish somebody who might be coming within range of him. For two power, it's not too bad. It's out of sequence attacks, which, again, really nice. It's a way of trying to get, generate that power outside of it. Uh, a savvy player can definitely play around it, so you got to watch out for that. Um, because they'll they'll be keeping that in mind, uh, but again, it, it all paints a, a a picture of a of a very power hungry character. He wants to do a lot of stuff, and I think you usually have to choose like one or two to do. Is he going to be support? Is he going to be aggressive? Is, is he going to be placing people around? Make those decisions and kind of stick that game plan. Uh, and then of course he's an Asgardian, so he gains an additional power every uh, every power phase. So he'll have uh, he'll have two power every every round at least to play with. So. Where, where does that leave us for for uh, good old Heimdall here? Well, obviously he's got his home of, in Asgard there. Uh, whether or not the leadership really does a whole lot for him, I don't think it really does. Uh, but then again, I, I have some concerns with the Asgard leadership. Uh, where he really likes is OG Steve, like the original core box Steve, where all of a sudden his abilities are costing one less. That four fin, that all seeing eyes, all of a sudden becomes two or one power. The guardian becomes two power. Uh, he can get a lot of utility out of that one, which is really nice. Uh, he becomes a really good support piece under that particular leadership. Alternatively, any leadership where you can give him more power, um, you know, maybe maybe siphon some power onto him through, say, A Force and Humans uh, or uh, or X Men Blue, for instance. It is a nice way of powering up his kit and making sure he can interact with more of the game, which is a, again another really nice option because the more often you're able to take advantage of his kit the more often he's going to be able to really help swing things for you. And I think he's got a really solid kit. I think he, he's got a lot to offer there. It's just getting him to that power he needs to be able to use it reliably and consistently. Uh, and again, it comes down to that, that range two threat range for a strike in his core fund. Uh, that just, it makes it difficult for him to feel an impact outside of his support roles uh, as a result. Um, which, again, it's unfortunate, because I think once he actually gets his combat kit going, he's got some really cool stuff that he has to offer the game. So I definitely I definitely recommend playing around with him. Share what you think his uh, his good uh, uh, places are to be. Like, I, I want to try him out in the new Marvel Knights with, with Daredevil, where he's get some rerolls within range 2. I think that can be really interesting. So, But I want to hear where you guys think he goes. So uh, definitely hit up the comments below, and uh, we will see you next time. Happy Wargaming!